Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in. Patrick King here, and this is episode number three of our new Talking About Horses live audio broadcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, I'm very excited to have here as a guest with me, my good friend, uh, Wendy Murdoch. Wendy, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's great to join you, Patrick. Awesome, awesome. So, Wendy, uh, for the, I don't know, three or four people out there in the horse world that have not heard of you or don't know uh, who Wendy Murdoch is, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your background? Um, yeah, I've been teaching and um, I've been a clinician for over 30 years. I apprenticed with Sally Swift in 1992. I was her last full-time apprentice. Um, I uh, have a master's degree in equine reproductive physiology, that's horse hormones, and so I have a very scientific approach to things. I want to know why it works, how it works, and understand it from a, um, a physical perspective, a scientific perspective, not just take somebody's word for it that this is the way something is. So I've, I've always been the one that's kind of like when somebody tells me something, I want to know, well you know, what's the, what's the science behind that or how does that work? Or I'll go back and research it and look it up. Um, and so awesome. that's kind of the, what I've always brought to it is the real, you know, it's not smoke and mirrors. This is the real nuts and bolts. You got to deal with gravity and how does it work? That's awesome. That's awesome. And that's, you know, it's, it's funny because I, I talk about you and that's, that's kind of how I talk about you to a lot of folks. Um, you know, I refer to you as a kind of a scientist that is involved with horses, you know, um, that, like you said, that scientific approach, that scientific perspective. Um, it's not, oh, he said this might work. She said this might work. History said this is tradition. Uh, and I tell people all the time, I'm pretty, um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Skeptical. I'm pretty skeptical about a lot of things. And I say, you know, there's there's very few people that I think I know more skeptical than me, and I would say that you're one of them. <laughs> so, like with, with things like Surefoot, you know, I, I tell people, and we'll talk about your Surefoot in maybe another broadcast, um, but sure. I tell people when I'm talking about Surefoot, I say, you know, it kind of sounded like baloney to me, but Wendy's the only person I know more skeptical than I am. So if she says there's something to it, there's got to be something to it. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm working all the time on finding out what is to it. And actually, I, I'm going to meet with Bob Bowker uh, on August 1st. He's the guy at MSU that's been studying the hoof, and he's like the barefoot people's guru on feet. Okay. So I'm actually going to get a chance to sit down and talk with him. But, there, you know, he's he's been doing a lot of research, and there's got to be some science behind it. We just have to dig, yes. right? Oh, yes. so I'm still working on that answer. Don't worry. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. And that, that is so much what I love about uh, you, Wendy, and working with you and the opportunities that we've had to do that together is that there's so much of a real, you know, a real basis behind it um, rather than just, you know, like you said, it's smoke and mirrors, you know, um, it, it's reality and it either works or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, why? Or if it does, why? You know, and, and I've, I've always gotten a lot out of our time together because of that. Uh, so I love that. So again, thanks for, thanks for coming on here with us. So the topic today, we said we wanted to talk about why it's important for the riders to pay attention to their position. I really love this. We talk a lot in my clinics about the rider's seat and about equitation and things like that. So when you're talking about a rider's position, are you referring to equitation in this? Um, you know, we can call it equitation because that's the, basically the, the definition. Um, I think of equitation as, as the rider's use of the body. So, okay. um, you know, I have to really look up the real definition of, you know, to have the really specific definition of the word. But to me, you know, and I used to equitate when I was a kid and I would take the equitation classes and it was all about rider position and function. You know, how well do you apply your aids and your horse respond to those aids? So... So sure, you could call it equitation. Okay. Um, okay. There's, you know, there's the there's a program called Equitation Science that's come out of Australia, and it's more about behavior modification and training. And I've always wondered why they use the word equitation instead of equestrian, and I'm still trying to sort that out. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Um, but anyway, so you know, to me, equitation is the the use of the rider's body and the net and the aids in terms of communicating to the horse. 
Gotcha. Okay, so equitation then is sort of the the sum total of then the position and how we use our position. Is that what you'd say? For me, yeah. Okay. I would, that would be my definition. I can always go and look up. And I don't know if I can look up in my favorite book. I have a favorite book. It's called Understanding Equitation by Jean St. Fort Payard. And um, this guy was, he's not, no longer alive, a Frenchman who was in the Olympics. And, you know, he, he titled his book Understanding Equitation, and it's all about the use of the rider's aid. So okay. Um, he's, okay. he's the only guy that ex has explained the role of the rider's lower back in, you know, I think better than anyone could. I just have read his definition at many clinics because he explains it so beautifully, and I so believe in exactly what how he refers to it. Um, so if anybody wants a really good definition of the role of the, the rider's lower back, this is a great book. And that's, I can list it up on my website so people can, you can only find That's awesome. Copies. That'd be fantastic. And I'd love to share that uh, with our folks here also. Can you tell us again the name of the book? It's called Understanding Equitation by okay. Jean St. Fort Payard. And awesome. um, it's, it's like I said, it's only in used uh, copies or, you know, I mean, it's out of print, but there's plenty of copies floating around and I will just um, actually, I'll put that up at the end. Fantastic. Perfect. 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 I know I'm going to be looking for that book if we don't have it in our library already at this point. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of the move. So the library is taking up most of a storage. Unit <laughs> and how right many now. library books do you have? <laughs> In your uh, horse library. It's, 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 um, it's quite a bit. It's quite a bit. I built in our Is last time in Ohio, I built an in, uh, an in wall bookshelf and we filled the whole wall. So, okay. So, so I have 450. <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm pretty sure you beat me. Damn. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what I have last I checked, but I have some duplicate copies. So maybe you'll inherit some things. You know? Ah, gotcha. Gotcha. We're going to have to compare notes at some point on books. That's fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. very. I have cool. to figure out where it goes. I gotta find somebody who's gonna carry it forward after I'm gone. There we go. Awesome. 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 Okay. So, uh, so then, as a rider, Wendy, why is it important for us to be aware of our position? Well, what I always tell people is gravity is not discipline specific. So ah. we live in gravity, right? We yeah. live in gravity. We're born in gravity. Everything in the known world is uh, affected by gravity right and it's it, no longer it, just a theory right we've proven that stuff <laughs> it's, it's not a theory you know apples fall to the ground riders fall to the ground um and there isn't anybody that i've met on this planet that can avoid it unless they go up in outer space and the biggest problem with going to outer space and long-term space travel is that when you're not in gravity your bones start to dissolve and your muscles dwindle because you yes. don't need them right and so you know like these people coming back from the space station uh, there was a photo the last time they showed some guys coming back and they were in these little cocoon like baby cradles because they couldn't stand up right because they've right. been in space too long so you know Everything comes back to the, the fact that because of gravity, we ride. There'd be no reason to ride without gravity because we would just bounce. And jumping would be sort of irrelevant, right? We wouldn't yes, want to sit right. on a horse to, to jump. I, I think jumping so that we feel that release from gravity for that split second, you know, that thrill of yeah. trying to you know, escape gravity and the fact that we come back down. Right. So... <laughs> on our own birthday. exactly right <laughs> some of us sooner yeah. and less planned but we always come back yeah. down we always come back down so because of gravity and its effects on us and you know whether it's sitting on a horse or just sitting at your computer or aging in general we are subject to gravity and if we use ourselves in a good way we minimize the gravitational effects and we maximize our potential so you know, I always tell people one of my favorite things to go watch is Cirque du Soleil because those performers defy, they appear to defy gravity. And they that's because they use gravity so effectively that they can do incredible things. So they, they're they using their body in that gravitational space to appear to defy it or do uh, things like high right, you know, tight wire high wire and tightrope and, you know, all the trapeze things. And we love it. We love watching people defy gravity. So um, that, that's the thing is 
if we use ourselves in a good way, then we can function efficiently. It's less stress on us. And we have to remember that that horse is subject to the effects of gravity all the time. And the minute we sit on its back, we are now either a help to that horse in gravity or a hindrance to that horse. Right. So, you know, if we use our, our aids and our body, if we equitate in a, in a good way, then we can aid the horse in using his body really effectively to carry us. And that's the bottom line when riding is it's not just a question of um, the, that the horse is, you know, just carrying himself. He has to carry the rider. And there's a, an efficient way to do that and an inefficient way. So I talk about the horse's weight-bearing posture as opposed to just his general posture in the field. When the horse walks to the water tank or goes to eat some grass, he's not carrying himself in the way he needs to to bear weight effectively. And this is where, you know, when people talk about uh, on nat- so that it's natural, it's, it's really not natural for the horse to carry the rider effectively. Right. You know, he, he, and that's the bottom line key here that we have to look at is if we want to uh, minimize our impact on the horse and minimize any damage that we could cause by asking him to bear weight and do crazy things that we ask them to do, um, they need to use their body in a very efficient way. And that weight-bearing posture it requires that the horse engage um, the sling mechanism, the thoracic sling in the front end, to lift the rib cage between the pillars of the front leg because they don't have a collarbone like we do. Right, right, exactly. So this weight-bearing posture, a lot of people um, don't necessarily understand it or recognize it, but they ha- they need to be able to lift that rib cage between the pillars of the front leg to minimize the pressure on the front feet. If they drop the withers, we just dramatically increase the pressure on the front feet, essentially overloaded them, put the horse on the forehand, and then we can start causing damage because there's too much strain on those feet and legs. Yes. And so it's, and, and that's the thing is, to what degree do we need the horse in weight-bearing posture? That's going to just kind of the, the task that we're asking them to do. Um, you know, if we're asking them to, to jump, you know, six-foot jumps, we really should be training them to carry themselves really, really well to minimize the impact. Because when you think about the landing side, if that rib cage and that rider's weight is dropping down as that horse lands, we're really loading those front legs. We're really pounding them into the ground. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this weight-bearing posture, um, it, it's sounding to me like we're talking about really um, self-carriage with the rider. Is that right? Yes. Right. And and again, there's there's stages of that and degrees of that. And, and this is where we come to one of the terms that I see currently most poorly understood, and that's collection. Yes. Because... People have been uh, falsely led to believe that if the horse yields to the bit, they are headed toward collection. And that is, um, in my opinion, a false impression because we're just going for a headset there. We're not looking at the entire physical system and what it has to do to to bear weight into collection, um, which has um, a much more um, sophisticated and greater uh, series of requirements in order for the horse to do that. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, my horse yields his jaw. I'm, I'm going to be collected. It's like, nope. Right. <laughs> that is one tiny little piece of this big picture. And in many ways, um, it, it can uh, be counterproductive if you get the horse to what I call allergic to the bit and dropping away from it. Yes, and that, so I was just going to ask you that. I'm really glad to, to hear you say that. So uh, when we talk about a horse yielding their jaw or what we see a lot now in the horsemanship clinics and, and the natural horsemanship idea and things like that, uh, riders talk a lot about having a soft feel. Um, and I, I kind of feel like I see a lot of this soft feel idea actually taking the horse down the wrong path because of, like you said, kind of the allergic reaction um, to the bit. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, because, um, you know, I have one of my um, 
very dear friends and whom I got two horses from. His name is Bruce Olson, and he's a guy sitting down in Richmond, Virginia. He's basically a musician, but he spent his childhood growing up at Jack Brainerd's ranch, and he's uh, he did reining, and he's a, an amazing rider because he can he's quintidextrous. He's a drummer who can sing, so he can do five different things at the same time. Wow. And, yeah, he's a, just, he's a really cool guy. I hope you get to meet him. Um, but Bruce would talk about the outer mouth and the inner mouth. And, unfortunately, what's happening in what I see today is we're only getting to the outer mouth, and we get it to, to such an extreme that we never get to what's called the inner mouth. So the outer mouth is the horse that yields his, his yielding. If you take the rein, he's going to uh, do what we call a soft feel. He's going to yield to the bit. He's going to drop off the bit. The problem is if the horse keeps dropping off the bit, he is never on the bit. You can't ever get him truly through and right. truly on the aid because he keeps evading the bit by dropping his jaw. And so this is where I'm going to take you to task a little bit. Um, because I'm pretty sure you had something about nose bands one day. <laughs> I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm a true, I, I really am a believer of the middle. You know, I always tell people, where's the middle? Because, and I wrote an article for Eclectic Horses Magazine. If your readers don't get Eclectic Horses Magazine, they might want to consider subscribing. Um, it's a great rag. I write for it. I wrote one of my favorite articles, which is called Where's the Middle? Um, it came out, I can't tell you what issue, but um, we the purpose of the nose band is not to, in my opinion, crank the jaw shut, right. but it's to limit the jaw and how much it can open. In other words, properly adjusted, two fingers underneath the jaw, one on top of the other stack, so that there you can get between the nose band and the horse's jaw. So if the horse opens his mouth, it is limited. Without a nose band, if the horse, and you, and you go for the soft feel, and he drops his jaw, all that time he's dropping his jaw and gaping his mouth, you are not getting to his feet. Yes, so exactly. what are you teaching him? You know, And so this is where we really got to think about where's the middle. The function of a nose band, and by the way, a bozella horse cannot yawn in, therefore it is a nose band. But the function of the nose right. band is to, is to limit, not to slam shut, and so if the horse keeps gaping the mouth, then what he's learning from the bit pressure is to evade the bit. And now we don't, we'll never get the horse on the bit because he just evades it. Right. And so it's, that's where Bruce talks about the outer mouth and the inner mouth. The outer mouth being that, you know, you pick up the reins and the horse doesn't brace against the bit, right? He yields to it. The inner mouth is the relaxation of the tongue resting on the bit so that all of the musculature is relaxed and in tone with the function. You have to realize that, you know, muscles require tone to do a function. So you have right. tension, tone, and lack of tone, flaccid, right? Okay. So you need this tongue to be relaxed in the horse's mouth so because of the deep connections that the, the hyoid system has. So now I've introduced this other whole new thing, all right? The hyoid bone is a series of bones that's up inside the jaw. People and horses have it. The tongue muscle attaches to the tab at the end. It looks kind of like a wishbone in people. Mm -hmm. There are over 20 muscles attached to the hyoid bone. There's one muscle that goes from the hyoid to the inside of the shoulder and one that goes from the hyoid to the sternum. Any tension in the back is going to result in mouth tension. Any tension in the mouth is going to re result in back tension due to this connection. Yes. So a lot of times people think they have a mouth problem, and really what they have is a back problem. And the horse is just expressing that problem in the mouth because that's the visible place, but that's not the cause. And since this is so critical to weight-bearing posture, the ability of the horse to lift the ribcage between the pillars of the front leg so that the neck lengthens and the horse comes more into a vertical frame, this whole piece is super, super important. That we need the horse to meet the bit in a relaxed way with a relaxed tongue. And if that doesn't happen, we don't have that in your mouth. We only have the outer mouth where the horse evades the bit. Yes, yes. 
Okay, so I hope I haven't lost your listeners. I don't know if there's any questions that anybody's been putting up there. I don't want to get too deep. But, right, no, you know, it's, is- you know, to me, it's it's deep, uh, but it's the kind of deep that we need to go, you know. Um, I, I tell writers all the time, I don't want to make this sound more complicated than it is, but sometimes it's a little more complicated than it is, you know. Um, it, well, we've been led down this garden path of... You know, you got to get the horse to yield to the bit. But if you overdo that, you will you will create yet another problem. Yes, and so exactly. This is what I always tell my you know my students will say you know I'll talk about a particular saddle and they go oh you don't like blah blah saddle and I'm like no 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 you don't understand. It's not that I don't like something. It's that you I always say you need to know your poison so that you know the antidote. If you know that this particular brand of saddle has this particular problem that you see consistently in that brand, then you will know to look for that. And if it's minimal in that particular saddle that you're looking at, you might be okay. But if you don't know that this particular brand always has consistently this problem in their manufacturing, you know, you're going to think everything's wonderful and yet you may have a problem. So, so that's where I say, if you know, you know, it's like, uh, I'm always looking for the middle, and I don't want the horse braced against the bit, but I don't want the horse dropping his jaw off the bit. I really want to find the middle place, and that teaching the horse to yield to the bit should be a momentary phase in their education to make sure they're not bracing. But if we keep going there without the rest of the function behind it, we cause a major problem because we'll never get the horse really on the aids, really in front of our leg, responding to our hands, responding to our feet, and in weight-bearing posture, which is so necessary for their good health. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm so glad that you brought up uh, the hyoid because it's something that I talk a lot about now whenever I teach my in-hand classes. So I have, I call it a groundwork class where we focus on the horse's mind first, and then we have an in-hand class where we focus on the mind and the body kind of coming together. Uh, and a huge piece of it is on really relaxing the jaw and getting to what sounds like Bruce is referring to as the inner mouth. Uh, and I recently had the opportunity to play around excavating uh, excavating a horse um, who had been oh, cool. uh, who had been put down not too long ago. Um, and it's in the excavation, the we way. found the whole hyoid. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, it's called exhumed when you dig up a dead body as opposed to excavate, which is... Exhumed. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, Um, So we we exhumed then um, this this, uh, horse, and the hyoid was intact. Um, Wow. As was actually the epiglottis, which tells me we got there kind of soon. Um, I was going to say you got there pretty early. <laughs> yes, so it was it was fascinating to me because I've seen a lot of diagrams of the hyoid, but I think I've only ever seen one actual photo um, of the hyoid, and it was amazing to me because I've known about the connections to the tongue and all that. Um, but to see the connection not only to the tongue but also to the roof of the mouth up there with the two side bones, and I, I can't right now offhand remember what they were called. Uh, but to see the entire connection to the top and the bottom coming through that hyoid apparatus was really just kind of a neat moment there. A lot of light bulbs in that moment, you know? Yeah. I, when you when you realize, and, and like I said, this is in people and horses, so we also have a hyoid that's as important right. uh, in terms of our body function. Right. Uh, it's, yeah, it's really cool. That's awesome. I think, and again, I'm going to, like, while we're talking, I'm, of course, going through my photos. I'm pretty sure I have a picture of the hyoid on a skeletal prep that I photographed years ago, but I'm going to have to dig. So I'll make a note because maybe I can put up a picture. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I, um, I, I took and we're treating and curing right now basically everything from uh, the first thoracic vertebra forward including the shoulder so that we can use that i've been using a skull a lot now in my bridling uh lectures and in a lot of a lot of the general clinics that i'm giving so folks can kind of see what's underneath what they're working on you know 
right. so they're they're working a little deeper than just on the surface you know so I'm, I'm pretty excited to have that whole deal uh, on hand now so anyway um, I think you and I could nerd out about this stuff all night long <laughs> <laughs> Again, this is why I love, love, love whenever we get the chance to chat together um, because there's so much that accidentally comes up that is just amazing. Um, so when we're talking then about the rider position, I know we're going to have, or I would imagine we're going to have some potential pushback from some riders saying, yeah, well, I'm a, a jumper or I'm a ranch rider or I'm a trail rider. And so what we're saying is that the rider's position uh, and I love how you said it, gravity, gravity is not discipline specific. Um, so this position is important regardless of what type of horse or what type of tack or what type of costume we have on or, or what we're doing, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, the, the way to think about it is if you've ever had a really favorite pair of shoes and you finally had to kind of retire them and you got a new pair of shoes, and then about a month later, you put those old shoes back on and you realize how warped they are. Well, yeah. that's what your horse is feeling all the time, right? And so they're going to have to model to you in order to carry you because they can't, you know, they're, they're going to, they're malleable and they, what horses do is compensate. And so for, for the issues that you have, they're going to have to compensate. Now that doesn't mean that, uh, we should quit riding because we've had injuries. It just means that we need to do our part of being responsible, that's able to respond, but be responsible to our horses to do our best and to keep learning about how we use our body because they're the ones who suffer for us. They're the, they're going to turn into that pair of shoes that warped if, if we keep ignoring our issues yeah. and just... You know, that's, making that's them a great analogy. To. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Um, so with with our horse now being a warped shoe, um, <laughs> what, what are some of the things that you're seeing as kind of the biggest or maybe the most common rider problems that you encounter? Um, the misunderstanding of what heels down is is perhaps the the biggest, if you will, fault that I see in rider position today because you have to realize everything's going to start from that foot. I, you know, you might think I'm obsessed with feet and ground. Um, and, but, <laughs> um, you know, with sure foot and everything and how I put like people on the pads, like I did with you at equine affair, yes. um, in Ohio, but you know, um, we have to make contact with the earth. We have to make contact with the ground and we have to organize our body in relation to the ground. So when we're on the horse, the ground is the stirrup. And if we jam our foot against the stirrup and brace against it, that's going to affect us all the way through the entire system. Yes. So uh, the, the misunderstanding of the foot and then what sit up, quote unquote, means. Because what most, most people do when they hear the term sit up is they throw their chest back, which hollows out their lower back and um, create a myriad of issues. I mean, the, I can't tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years and I put my hands on somebody on a horse and I get them to, to, to lengthen their back and soften their belly and fold to their rib cages over their pelvis. And just to a person, they tell me they feel slumpy. It feels wrong. Yes. It doesn't feel right. And yet the horses prove me out time and time and time again, because they're the ones who have to deal with whatever we do. Yeah, absolutely. So regardless of what we um, perceive uh, as correct, it's the, we have to look at our horses and let them tell us what, where they can function best. And in the end, good function looks great, but we are so unaccustomed to where that is, that place where we can really maximize our, our body and use it efficiently and in relation to the horse's movement because we've all been, you know, screamed at, heels down, sit up, chest out, shoulders back, yeah. um, and not understood what is the intent, what are we trying to get to? What we're trying to get to is good use of our body so our horse can respond. You know, yeah. so that they can be responsible to us and right. we can be responsible to them. 
so so in in following along that train of thought um and and maybe i should have taken a little more time to phrase frame my question but do you feel like a big piece of this improper position um or this less than ideal position or whatever we want to call it uh is kind of the result of trying to mimic riders that you know a rider trying to mimic other riders that they see that are more in kind of the the fashion show idea because i think a lot of what we see and correct me if i'm wrong but a lot of what i think we're seeing in uh, our competitive disciplines now is just so much of a fad you know um of sitting in one way riding in one way you know moving a horse in a specific way and all of those things i think are are challenging the riders to mimic that um is well, that something you notice well i think it's actually deeper than that unfortunately okay do tell um and i because uh, well i i am of a generation that remembers uh, what it was like back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And when I was a kid, I would go to Oxford Tongue Club Horse Show and I would watch all the hunter jumper riders and the top show jumping riders. I watched Bill Steinkraut and Ronnie Much and Victor Hugo Vidal was teaching and uh, George Morris had, um, had been, he was just starting to become a professional. Um, and uh, you know, Kathy Kuzner and all these greats. And they were all basically trained by Bert Dynamothy. And Bert Dynamothy was a Hungarian cavalry yes. officer who came to this country and he trained our Olympic team. And they all trained together. They would go down to Gladstone and they all trained as a team. And they were true amateurs, too. I mean, like, Bill Steinkraus is a true amateur. And they worked on the fundamental. They were put on lunge lines. But if you ever get a copy, I think it's actually finally back in print, of Bert Dynamothy's book, The Dynamothy Method. And you look at the photograph of this man sitting on his horse. He has a perfectly flat back and a level foot. Yes. And that is his ideal rider position. It's what I teach. What happened and you can look at there's a on Facebook there's a great website called uh, Back in the Day. It's a, I think it's Equestrian Back in the Day. Yeah, 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 and yeah. They, I've seen that. Yes, it's, it's fabulous because they put up all these old photos. And if you look at the photos, I can actually look at the photos and tell you what decade that person learned to ride. If you look at the photos, you'll see a, the the function of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and toward the end of the 70s, and then absolutely 80s and forward it changed and it changed for a couple of reasons one we were no we no longer had a cavalry so we no longer had the military influence good bad or otherwise the military influence on what was correct position two money money came into the sport it became a pleasure sport it became a hobby sport and there was a lot of people you know who were wanted to get into the showing and all the social aspects and everything. And so we moved from a military based function to a style where the color of the lining of your coat mattered whether or not you pinned. Right. And then the level of education significantly dropped because now people were going in and starting to teach that really didn't have the basis of education. And then we shifted to the crest release where people started parking their hands on the horse's neck yes. instead of being taught what's called a following hand. Right. And um, so the minute we lost the following hand, which required balance as opposed to resting on the horse's neck, the rider position just basically went to hell. So we switched and from riding we, into perching. Yeah. I mean, once you park the hands and stop teaching on a, a following hand, which when, in my day, a following hand meant that you had a straight line from elbow to bit and you followed that horse's mouth. It was a very sophisticated uh, aid because you could turn your horse over the jump. And so to, to learn how to do a following hand, there was no crest relief. It did not exist in my generation when I was taught. It did not exist till like the late 70s and 80s. And so you were basically taught 
um, in grids. I mean, I can remember going through grid after grid after grid, and you would go through them without hands. You yes. know, you'd tie your reins in a knot and go through a grid, and you found your balance. And um, so, you know, you weren't allowed to rest on the horse's neck. You weren't allowed to hang on his mouth. And then when you had the reins, because you already had the balance and the position, you could simply follow the horse's mouth because you didn't need the horse's mouth and you didn't need your hands. And this is, you know, in my jumping book, the one thing that I talk about in my jumping book is exactly that. It's in the, it's, I think it's at the back of the book, but, you know, what happened is that we lost this functional position and we went to a style and we, you know, people are terrified to jump three foot nowadays. They have all these little tiny jumping classes of yes. poles on the ground because, <laughs> You know, right. because people can't jump because they're not being taught a functional position. And the problem is that as we get further and further away from it, there are fewer and fewer people who know what it is and know how to teach it. And so we're we're losing that information. It's still out there. I mean, I have the pre-World War II Fort Riley cavalry training tapes in my library and wow. show the, you know, the stop. It's, it's great. It's like a, a black and white Western film. It's so beautifully scripted. And they freeze frame it and they draw the lines and they send Smith over the jumps. And here's Smith. You show them how to go down the bank. It's great. I love it. I'll show it to you sometime. That's very cool. Um, yeah, but that's what happened is we, we went from function to fad and yes. we, and we haven't really gotten back. And, and it's just like, um, you know, it's the English version of the yielding the bra with the soft feel thing is that it's gotten so carried away that we've lost the original intent, which was just, I mean, I'll have students put their hands on the horse's neck for a brief moment in time in their learning process to figure out how to get their hips back and not brace against their stirrups, but to allow their joints to absorb. And then I take the reins away and run them through grids. And I will, you know, if I ever get to ride my, write my second jumping book, it's all the grid exercises that I that I set up when I go and teach a pony club clinic that they've got to get through. And if they can't get through, they don't get their reins back. That's fantastic. <laughs> that is fantastic. You know? But once you can do all those exercises, the understanding of where you need to be, and I'll tell you, the hardest thing to rework is a poor jumping position because the moment of the jump is such a short moment in time that I can do in a, you know, in a four day clinic, I can get everybody's position we worked on the flat, reworked over poles, reworked over cross rail. And the minute they see it as a jump, I lose them. Because yeah, the muscle brain memory is so, yeah. yeah, so rapid. So, you know, it's like, okay, now I've got you up to an 18-inch cross rail, and you need to live here for about six months, sorry, until you rework that in your brain, and then we can build. Because otherwise, you see jump, and the brain is reacting so rapidly to the position that has been established through poor instruction, in my opinion, yes. um, that, you know, it's really hard to rework it, which is why, you know, you're not going to get a big-time show jump for coming and having their position taken down, because they have adapted to it and they can survive over the jump. Um, but I have a, I have a great student out in Washington state and she is, if she's five foot, I don't even think she is. Um, and she's been a student of mine and um, she's in my jumping book. And I just saw a video of her jumping round and it is so lovely. And she has an automatic release and her position is so nice. And her j horse jumps like a hunter because a good hunter <laughs> yeah okay um, good yeah. over the jump because he can jump out of stride and yeah. what do i mean by jumping out of stride that the horse comes up to the jump and doesn't change rhythm and what you see nowadays is the horses come up and they have to break rhythm pass the ground with the front feet because their withers are dropping down relative to their front legs so they're not in good weight bearing posture right. and then come up over the jump and so the, you know why do we have so many problems with these horses because they are not jumping in a correct align organization with their withers up and their back round. Anyway, okay, you've led me down that garden path. Yeah, no. <laughs> you me back a little bit. <laughs> no, that's great though. I mean, that so that's I'm kind of drawing some lines in my mind of the riders learning poor position and having a challenge and and referring back to muscle memory. 
uh, I, I'm drawing the line there directly to these horses that learn kind of a poor philosophy about the bit or about the bridle and, and how mm -hmm. that's so difficult to rework them into proper uh, carriage and, and balance. Right, because whatever you learn first, you have to remember that horses have a gigantic cerebellum and a, and a big motor cortex and very little what we call frontal lobe or neocortex. We have a much smaller relative to the horse cerebellum, which is where we store all those motor patterns and, and m muscle memory, if you will, which doesn't exist in the muscles, it exists in the brain. Right. But, you know, and we have a motor cortex. So we're motor movement cre creatures just like the horse, but the horse doesn't, he can't make up stories. Right. So right. The, the good news is that, and this is where Sherfoot comes in, is that I've seen horses literally in seconds rework motor patterns when you offer them something that, that brings their attention to what they're doing. Um, with people, it's harder because we have these stories. Oh, I, but I've got to sit up straight. Oh, I'm not straight. Oh, I don't look right. Oh, you know, we have this yes. self-image thing yes. that we keep struggling with. And, and so we run this repertoire of self-image and how this isn't correct. But if I can get people out of that thinking mode and into the motor movement pattern, we can, we have a chance. We have to teach, I teach them the way I teach horses with minimal words and a lot of movement yeah, um, and a lot yeah. of challenge to that movement because the minute you get them trying to analyze, you're, you're stunk. So uh, yes. um, you got to get them out of the analytical mind, which cannot handle movement. I mean, it's like, you know, you don't move in the, in the analytical mind. You move in the motor cortex and the cerebellum and the stored patterns in your brain. So you've got to get people to not um, try to uh, analyze movement, but just to experience movement and different types of movement. Um, because otherwise, there, you, you, you know, there's no way. If you tried to think of everything you needed to do to stand up out of your chair, you'd die there. We'd find you there all moldy. <laughs> yes. You know. Right. Well, to, it's, it's funny because chair. that's bringing me to a memory that I have of you teaching a clinic um, in Greensburg uh, when, when I hosted you down there. And somebody had a question, and I'll be darned if I can remember the question, but your response was awesome. You said, that's, that's just too cerebral. Just go ride. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, because I mean, riding is movement, and movement is life. And so, you know, when we stop moving, if you look at old people, what's happening? They're not moving anymore. Right. You know, moving is life. Why do we ride? Because we move. You know, why do we love horses? They move us. It's all about movement, and so it's real important that if we want to avoid injuries in both the horse and in ourselves, and to really enjoy this process and not have the fear you know, that so many women have, because the brain knows when you're not stable. The brain sends you that message of fear to say, hey, you know what, something's not quite right. Yes. But then we, we analyze it, and we go, well, I just shouldn't be afraid, or I'm just terrified, you know, but I'm frozen because I've put myself so beyond the pale without the proper information. And so our brain recognizes when we're stable and when we're safe. And what we have to do in riding is be able to experience that place. That's the first thing I teach people is like, here's where you're solid. Here's your home base. And so they can feel that stability and then the fear drops away and then they can actually start to learn to move with their horse. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it, yeah, it, but there's, you know, people as we get older, children just move. Right? right. They don't right. have the brain to analyze that it hasn't developed yet. Literally, they don't have the ability. So that's what's so cool about them is that when you get like that 11, 12 year old child, they're all about movement and they're not about analysis. So you, they've finally got some coordination skills. The brain's developed enough that they can organize. And I mean, that's their perfect moment to rise. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, then we become self-aware and self-insecure. You know, we go through puberty and then we start to, you know, develop the brain more and we get very analytical and, um, you know, and we have to get back to the, that 12, 13 year old concept of learning where it, uh, you know, feeling movement and being able to coordinate. Um, 
We can do it. We can do it, but you know, like. Okay, so that's that's going to bring me into the next question. So that's a perfect segue. So you say we can do it. Um, what? So for our riders that have developed their positions or developed their habits or their, uh, you know, all these these challenges. How do they do it? How do they go about becoming more aware? Or how do they be, go about fixing these these problems they have? Um, the, the first thing is you have to have a choice, right? And that if you don't have a choice, you can't let go of what you've got. You know, if if you have the, the last, uh, what's your favorite drink? <laughs> what's my favorite drink? Um, with, with coffee. Salad, right? <laughs> <laughs> coffee. Oh, it's the, that's right. The, that you and I are like that. <laughs> it's the last cup of coffee on the planet. Are you going to give it up? No. Right. right. So if you don't have a choice, you can't give it up. So the first thing is to start experiencing some choices in a safe environment. And so it's like having doing some exploration, of being willing to allow yourself to explore and experiment like that 12 or 13 year old within reasonable limits. In other words, you don't take the unbroken two-year-old horse and jump on and go, I'm going to explore. No, no, no. <laughs> but Wendy said it would work. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not it. But, you know, in within reasonable limits, with you know, the, exploring different ideas, being willing to try something and look at your horse and let your horse respond to it rather than, always trying to please what someone else has told you you're supposed to do. And that's kind of like, um, you know, that's such a radical thought in, in that we can be our own teacher. Yeah. And um, that's what I'm always trying to do is empower my students to not need me. Right, right. <laughs> you know, mm. it's, I want my students to have a basis of knowledge and a basis of from which they can experiment to explore and let the horse start to show them what happens as opposed to, I have to get it right. The minute we have the right and wrong concept, there's no exploration. There's no curiosity um, because you're too afraid to try something because you might quote unquote ruin your horse. Yeah. Right. I hear that all the time from writers. I'm so afraid to mess him up. Right. And you know what? You're going to because that's learning. And it's we want to make small experiments in the beginning so we don't make the really big ones later. It's like, you know, giving the child some responsibility to handle a little pocket knife when they're young so when they have the big kitchen knife later, they don't cut their finger off. Right. 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 <laughs> it's learning that <laughs> it's okay to, you know, to, to, to explore a little bit and try some things. But unfortunately, most teaching is is fear based. You know, if you get it wrong, you're going to get yelled at, or if you get it wrong, you're going to mess up your horse, or if you get it wrong, you know, something really catastrophic is going to happen. But, and also the perceived self image. Oh, I've got to be, but I have to be this. I have to sit up. I have to have my heels down. You know, it's like really you do. Right. right. <laughs> what happens? What happened? Oh, look, you didn't die. Um, <laughs> And that's, <laughs> but I do, that's what I do is I come in and I break, um, I intentionally and purposefully break down the, these misconceived concepts and the, the, the person's, um, uh, if you will, belief systems to yeah. get them to start being curious and exploring and investigative and trying different things and being childlike in their learning process with their horse. And believe me, the horses get it. They're like, oh, if you make a mistake and your intention was good, they're fine. But, you know, if you intend to harm them, they're going to know the intent is to harm. So, right. you know, they really perceive the intention and they're very tolerant and they're very forgiving of honest mistakes you know um and so i think that you can't go through life with them in bubble wrap it's not going to work right riders um, and horses yeah riders and horses and we want to minimize the risks so that we keep the horse and rider as safe as possible 
we want to minimize the risk, but at the same time, we have to develop this interaction, this curiosity, and this exploration so that the horse gets to give us feedback and and we use the horse as our mirror, as our feedback, and start exploring and trying new ideas and different things and going, oh, wow, that worked. Oh, that didn't work. I mean, I do it all the time. I do stuff all the time. I go, oh, that didn't work. All right, well, let's try something else, you know. <laughs> right, and, right. and how many trainers? Yeah, every trainer you know does that. Every single trainer Absolutely. you know does well, that. All the good ones, yeah. Yeah, you know, because it's that exploration and just finding out, okay, does, how does this you know, does this work? And and obviously, you know, we again we want to minimize the risk to everyone. Um, there's a you have to have a certain amount of uh, good judgment. Um, but this is the other thing I find, and and I think we've talked about this before. Um, as I tell people, you know, most of my clients now are adults. Yes. And so many of them are doctors or lawyers or, you know, they've been career moms raising four kids or um, nurses or they've had professional jobs and they've had to make professional job decisions. So they already have the skills to assess and evaluate. Is this a smart thing to do? Is this a dumb thing to do? You know, can I do a little bit of this? Yeah, I can. Or no, well, not in this environment, not in this situation. But I call it take your adult with you. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Because so many adult riders are child-ish with their horses. As yeah. opposed to adults enjoying their horses as adults and having that parent, being able to parent themselves in relation to their horse. So um, what I mean by that is, Someone who has grown up with horses all their life. You have grown up with horses all your life. I have grown up with horses all my life. I have matured in my uh, behavior and my mannerisms and my uh, life with horses in my life. So w my um, emotional self has matured with horses around me, and I've grown through all those stages. People who were denied the horse as a child and then come to horses later in life are emotionally that child that was at the age at which they were denied, is my opinion. Okay. So if you at 12 years old, you wanted a horse, and mom and dad said, it's not happening. And for the next 40 years, you have yearned to have a horse, and you finally go to look for your horse. You're a 12-year-old looking for a horse, not a 52-year-old. Gotcha. And this is where you need to take your adult with you. You need to take the one that's been the mom raising four kids. When you go to look at the horse and you say, would this be appropriate for my 10-year-old? No, I will not buy the unbroken four-year-old stallion. Right. And so then this <laughs> is why we see so much of the time, oh, but he's so beautiful. Yes, because they're emotionally children. Yes. And wow. so, you know, this is where I always say you've got to take your adult with you and you know what is that 52 year old woman who's not ever ridden and is really finally going to get into riding and have a nice she needs a like 17 year old quarter horse that was in a school setting that yeah. you know has seen everything done everything and that's her first horse right something capable you know, of teaching her and taking care of her in spite of mistakes Right, and who's like seen it all and is totally unflappable and totally unfazed. Okay, yeah, been there, seen that. I know what that is. I don't have right. to react to it. Right. right, right. That's what they need. And that's what they would get for their child, hopefully. <laughs> right. right? Yeah, but, well, yeah, well, we would hope, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> but, you know, as an adult who's finally fulfilling their lifelong dream of having a horse, they're still thinking black beauty. Yeah. They're still thinking of the riding on the beach with the mane flowing and bridalist and in the breeze and running through the water because they're they're emotionally children. And that's not a it's not a bad thing because you're finally getting to fulfill that childhood desire. You have to take your adult with you to make sure you make wise choices so that you don't jeopardize the 52-year-old <laughs> in her right. Right? Yeah, that in makes her so desire much sense. To be 12. Yeah. Um, and so this is where, you know, we need that reality check of, oh, yeah, I, you know, I'm 52. I, I'm just getting into horses. I've had a desk job for the past, you know, 20 years. I'm a little overweight. I'm a bit unfit. 
I really want to have my horse now. I finally, the kids are out of college and they're, they've moved on. They've, you know, and I have the time and I have the income. What they really need is that steady Eddie going to take care of them horse. Not black kitty. Not black kitty. Yeah. Wow. You know, that's that's perfect advice. Yeah. Yeah, and so this is where we just have to make those wise decisions of taking our adult with us and taking an adult with us when, you know, like, I'll never forget there was a book that came out quite a few years ago now, and someone asked me to write a review, and the author was telling adult women to take their horse out bareback in the dark to bond with them and ride in the dark. Oh, my God. And I just, you know, as a professional and a writing instructor my review was like this is a great coffee table book and do not do this <laughs> <laughs> you know um because you're you know you're not that 12 year old that if you right. fall off you're going to be okay or you know i mean right. what if you're, yeah whatever. there's no bouncing there's there's just splattering at that point right and so this is where you know it taking the adult with us that has matured in this world that understands our limitations as an adult. And yet we, we can still fulfill those childhood dreams. And that's what's so important is that yes, get a horse. Yes. Go learn to ride. Please take care of yourself. Please take your adult with you and hold your child's hand when they start running towards the horse that's snorting like crazy. And, you know, (laughs) it's just brought in from the range and say, no, let's find one that's more appropriate for you at this stage in your life. Right. And then you're actually going to have a good time and you're not going to be terrified. And so if you explore a little bit and you make a mistake, the horse is going to go, yeah, whatever. I've seen that before. You know, it's okay. Um, and then, and then you really can fulfill your dream because then you really have that horse that will look after you instead of be terrified by your, you know, lack of experience. Right. Right. Instead of getting the horse that really at their stage needs you to look after them. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. You know, and then you have the middle group, which is the road up until the 20s, got a job, had kids, got married, quit riding for a while, and they come back. And so their needs, um, they can fall into uh, the the other two categories. They can fall into the still have the black duty dream Mm -hmm. or the mature adult rider, depending on where in the spectrum that they're, that they left horses. A lot of women wind up with the kids went into pony club. They, you know, aged out, they've gone off to college. I've now inherited the horse. Yes. But they've been sitting there ringside watching lesson after lesson after lesson. So there's a different um, maturity, if you will, at that point, they know the horse, they've seen the horse, it's the kid's horse, he's rallied everywhere, you know, he's trailered everywhere, and now I've inherited him. Um, and then there's the sort of more toward the black beauty types that they, you know, they went off to college, and they, they're they thinking that they're 17, and they get on the horse, and they've had four babies, and now they don't, they can't find their center, which what I find invariably is it's not very far away, but it's not where they're looking because they're looking in that old body or where, you know, that young body, I should say that 17 year old body where their center of mass was. And it's shifted a little as you've aged and, um, you know, had whatever injuries and stuff, but you know, you show them where that is and that bingo, they're good. I mean, it's amazing. And, and those are the riders I find can get so frustrated with themselves because they have the feel of what it used to be, and they struggle to get that, you know, to get right. that back. They they long for when they could ride on the beach with the wind blowing through their hair and everything was great, and now they're afraid. Um, and so they're, you're right. They struggle with what they knew they could do and what they're doing now. And so that's, again, it's a, that maturity of saying, okay, I'm, it's not the same body it was when I was 17. You know, I've had three kids. Um, I, you know, I, I had an injury. I had a death job. But I know, but I know that I had certain tools. And also, you know, it's like um, I didn't have a horse for for a period of years. And when I got a horse again, I had gone from traditional medicine to more holistic medicine, and I was completely lost. I had done that for myself. But when it came to the horse, I didn't know what to do anymore because all of my traditional stuff I'd let go of. And, but I 
never kept a horse in a holistic sense. So I had a huge learning curve oh, of, yeah. you know, how do I do, you know, how do I treat this? Oh, it's, you know, <laughs> the stuff I used to use doesn't, you know, it does exist if you really look back. <laughs> right, right. You know, the old purple stuff you used to put on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can't even remember <laughs> what it's called. And, um, yeah, you know, stuff like that. It's like, well, it doesn't even really exist anymore. It's really not healthy for you, and it was kind of toxic. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. And that might be why you glow in the dark. Yeah. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned the riders having injuries and that, um, that kind of gets in the way, of course. Um, so I'm reminded of, again, I, I believe it was that same clinic that you taught, um, uh, at my place a few years back. Um, I, and I love, and I tell people this all the time. I love how you start your clinics with your notebook, basically saying, give me every injury you've ever had. Um, and I remember <laughs> yeah. one particular rider, um, she didn't make it half a lap around the arena and you went back into your notebook and you were leafing through and she had 17 pages of injuries, uh, not literally, but, uh, she had all these injuries and you're looking through and then you look back up at her and you said, and I'll leave her name out, uh, but you said, why didn't you tell me about your right shoulder injury? I don't know if you remember that. I, I don't, but that doesn't surprise me. I do that often. <laughs> so that uh, that blew my mind then, and it still blows my mind now. Because you didn't say, did you ever have a right shoulder injury? She told you about 27 different injuries that she had, and you specifically pointed out and said, why didn't you tell me about the right shoulder injury? How do you do that? How do I do that? Yeah. I mean, I think I know the answer, but, but you uh, know, it's still impressive either way because you were sure. You, you had no question in your mind if there was one. You knew there was, and she left it out of the equation. Um, so, um, you know, this is the thing that uh, people have said this to me in the past, and I, I, it's like I don't realize what I do. Yes. Um. And other people point out to me what what I do, but to me, it's like breathing. So when I look at, uh, but I have to caveat this. Um, I see movement. Yes. And 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 that's and I see movement, but I don't see things that have been moved. My example: I was in Europe. Brad sent me three pictures of the front of my house from the driveway from the from the front lawn and I think one other. And all I could think of is why did he send me these pictures of the house? The reason he sent me these pictures is that he moved a 30 foot maple tree from oh, the no. smack dab in the middle of the front of the house in the lawn to the, to the driveway curve. And I didn't see it. <laughs> and that's because it didn't move. Because it was still it was in the moved. photo. Correct. Okay. It was moved, so I didn't see it. It did not exist. It was. It just didn't register. Gotcha. But if 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 something moves, I perceive movement, and so I perceive lack of movement as well. And that's when I when I'm working with someone, like in that in, instance. I can't remember the person individually, but I'm sure that what I perceived was a lack of movement. That would have been associated with the right shoulder injury and then compensations thereafter. Yep. Fascinating. Fascinating. But if it doesn't move, I don't see it. Right? <laughs> so you can see the gigantic tree and, you know, move it in the yard. And I, I was like, what did Brad send you these pictures? So you don't have our gifts. So, so basically, I mean, in that sense, you you performed a lameness examination on a rider, right? Like we would on a horse. Yeah, in a sense, yeah. And so I, I, um, uh, you know, like literally, if I see somebody ride the trot for probably five seconds, I pretty much know what I've got. Yeah. I use rising trot as my. Um, uh, uh, what's the word for it? You know, that's that. If I see someone do rising trot, 
for like a, just a couple strides. I basically know what's going on. Um, and so that's kind of, that's what I use as my, like they can walk and I'll see some things, but the minute they pick up that trot, I, I know what I got to do. Um, gotcha. and so, um, that's really the movement that I use the most in terms of evaluating somebody. Um, you know, one time I, uh, somebody told me about this, there was this website and they had looked at like really talented people and they were trying to figure out how they did what they did. And so I guess there were these glasses they put on and basic, and this is why it's difficult to teach because people who are really good at what they do are taking in a variety of data points and it's not just straight looking. And most people, what happens when they try to see something is they stare at it. And I'll never forget working with Tony Gonzalez, if you remember that name. It goes back a few years. Um, Tony Gonzalez was, he actually was a farrier who got people to look at saddles, to look up. As a farrier, he recognized you had to look at what was going on above to figure out why this foot was doing what it was doing. And so he actually was very instrumental in in bringing the concept of good saddle fit to the forefront, and we're talking 1987. Okay. Because wow. I went to Australia in 80, well, I was 87, 88. I'd heard of him before I went to Australia. I went there for a year and came back in November of 88, and I landed in LA and went to a clinic that he did. And, um, and he said, it's eight seconds. If you look at anything for more than eight seconds, you've got to look away. But that's basically... Uh, the, after eight seconds, you're not going to see it anyway because now you're starting to change the way you look at it, probably staring. He didn't actually define it, but he always talked about eight seconds as, as your max time to evaluate. And then you can look at it again, but you've got a break after eight seconds. You That's your, that your limit. Interesting. Right, because, yeah, so he actually had a, had a, a you know, a time frame on it. Um, and... And so if you take that idea and you take this idea of uh, data points, not just one perceived thing, and that's the problem when you go to teach. And actually, I just did a um, – we're working on an online course on how to see. Um, so CRK Training and I okay. filmed another course. It's not out yet. We're, we're still doing um, – we're still kind of refining it. But the whole intent of the course is, is helping people see what I see. Because, like, to me, it's like breathing. You just look and it's right there. Yes. And, you know, I've been doing it for so long, I can't tell you when when I developed this eye that I have. But it is teachable. It's totally teachable. You just have to give people data points and, and clue them in on where to look. And, again, it's not staring, but just kind of like packeting, gathering a packet of information and then, you know, glancing at it again, if you will, it's that peripheral vision rather than staring at it. Um, and so what I've done in the course is I've put dots on horses and pointed out things and we're doing before and afters and slow motions and, and cool stuff to just break it down and simplify it to help people to start to see. And this is stuff that I've done in my courses and I'll do this in instructor courses and stuff like that is, is start breaking things down and helping people see because what I, what I, you know, like I said, to me, it's like everybody should be able to see what I see. Right. I don't see why they can't. Right. Because <laughs> so, they're, they're you know, looking, but you're actually seeing. Yeah. And, and so I don't realize that people so often, you know, people go, well, well how, how do you see that? And this was when we filmed the Surefoot DVD. The biggest problem I had when it came to the editing is making sure people saw what I saw yeah. uh, with the horses so that they realized what was going on. Right. And so that was just one of the big things that, that, you know, again, it's like, it's no good if you can't see that the horse is swaying or waving or, you know, licking and chewing or sighing or lowering its head and neck. If you can't see it, you don't know. It, it doesn't exist. Yeah, right, right. right. There's a story about when the first – uh, European boats came to the United, to, came to the Americas and the, met the Indians, and the Indians couldn't see the boats. They'd never seen a boat. They didn't know what a boat was, so they couldn't yeah. see it. Right. And then, as the story goes, the shaman of the tribe went to the ocean's edge, and what he 
noticed was the change in the wave pattern of the water. And as he noticed the change in the wave pattern of the water, then he could see the boat. Wow. So, yeah, so I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, it's a very interesting story because the boat was there all the time. It's that we have to start to see different things that indicate that it's there. Yeah. Um, and this is true. You know, my favorite movie, uh, it, no get, you, know, you want to guess what my favorite movie is? Oh, my gosh. I... Oh, come on. Oh, you might be too young. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Well, then I'm not even going to take it. It's been around guess. for a very, very long time, okay? Um, my favorite movie is The Wizard of Oz. Oh, okay. Okay. And the reason The Wizard yes. of Oz is my favorite movie is that Dorothy had the ruby slippers the whole time. Yes. She had to go past the flying monkeys before she believed it. Yes. Okay? So she had the power to go home the whole time. We have the power to see. We have the power to change. We have the ability to ride better and do good for our horses. We just have to use it. We have to acknowledge that we have the the ability and then we have to learn how to use it right and we all can do this we you know it's like i don't ever see what i do as all that special um i think that everybody can can do this right. um i think all my students can can ride much better and more effectively and they all do because i i believe they can right um and I, I believe I can show them how to do that, and that's what I do. And I believe that we all have the ability to see more, to see more fine detail. We just need the opportunity to be able to be shown how to see because it's not what we value in our culture. We don't value uh, the individual's ability to be self-responsible right. in that way. Um you know, we value the idea that somebody tells us what to say and we say it back to them in our educational system. And I grew up, you know, like I went to public school. It did me a lot of good. Um, yeah. But I learned how to learn and I teach people how to learn, not just writing, but like, you know, I mean, I've, I, if you want to learn how to do something and I know how to do it, I can break it down and teach you because I know how to teach. Yes, right, um, right. And I can see what the packets are. You need this. That's where I get back to the scientific stuff. Is you need to see this in in these increments. I can't go to to letter K unless you have A, B, and C. You can't spell luck without four letters. You can't spell trot without four more letters. So if I construct an alphabet, a language for you, then you can start to build more complex words and then, you know. Um, multiple syllables and then sentence, short sentences, walk and halt, halt, trot. You know, you can start building on that because we have a language and we have, you have the skills and the letters in the alphabet to be able to do it. Um, and that's my job as a teacher. That's what I see as my responsibility is to make sure that you have all the letters you need and then you know how to form the word. Fascinating. That's, that, that makes so much sense. Uh, and yet still we see so many riders, um, like you said, afraid to experiment in that or not able to notice. Uh, yeah, because we're, we're, you know, I mean, we, we need to, um, it's how we teach and we've gotten stuck into sort of a quasi military perspective you're the student, I'm the instructor, I tell you what to do, you do what I tell you, as opposed to an, um, an educational, I, here are the skills that you need, here's the development of those skills, here's the progression of those skills, this is where you're going to wind up because of the progression. Um, and, you know, so many places, like, they feel like in order for the students to feel like they're progressing, they have to make them do things that they haven't given them the skills to do, so they terrify them or overface them or yell at them and yet people still want to ride. And so they'll put up with that, which is sad. They'll put up with that because they value being with the horse so much. That's so important to them. Yeah. And so I just think it, you know, we, we did come from military and there's some great value in the military education in terms of the, the 
equitation, the position, the rider function, the use of the aids. That's great stuff. But then we have to look at what is the population we're teaching. It's a, a lot of adults now who, um, you know, want to have a good time. So we've got to marry the idea of giving them the right skill set with their uh, desire to enjoy the process because they're not, you know, uh, soldiers and make it fun. But the thing we have to do the most, Patrick, and I feel so strongly about is we have to find some way to bring, reintegrate horses and people in communities and find a way to get the horse, you know, bring back riding stables and bring back places where people can go and experience horses without having to own them that are safe horses with good instruction. I don't know how it's going to happen in this country, but if we don't do that, if we don't make riding an educational system that's part of our activities in our daily life, we're going to lose horses. Yeah. We're going to lose them at, a, at an incredibly rapid rate of speed, and I see it. I see it in this country. I don't see that happening in Europe. Because I, you know, I I was at Equitana for nine days. Equitana is in Essen, Germany. It's the biggest horse expo in the world. Two hundred and fifty thousand people. Two hundred and fifty thousand people came through the doors in nine days. It was from ten till six every day. The place was packed. There was kids' day. There were billions of children around. But what the Europeans have done, in my opinion, you know, because I keep thinking about this and I think about what I see happening here. In Europe, they have integrated horses into their communities, so they're, you know, they have much less land mass. Right. Uh, like Holland, for instance, is like so tiny. Um, you know, you can drive all the way around Holland in less in, in about three hours or something crazy. Um, wow. But well, Belgium actually. Um, but they they have stables and housing and office buildings all within basically bicycle distance of each other. So the, the horses and the riding stables, and there's big riding stables and school horses and, you know, kids, that's the activity they do. Instead of play soccer, they go and they ride. They've integrated into the community, and they have riding school. And in this country now, unless you own a horse, it's really hard to find a place to ride a horse. Right. Um, I, I have I, sort of a, a little aside. Um, my mom lives with me now and she's 92 and we just sold her house and and so i moved all of the genealogy and the family photos and everything to my house and so one of my projects as if i don't have enough <laughs> one of my projects I, is to scan in all the 35 millimeter slides my dad took oh. so that i can right pass it out to the to everybody so they can all have access to digital as opposed to the 35 millimeter slides, which is basically gone away. Yeah. And as I've been scanning in these pictures, I found, and I'm going to post it on Thursday, um, last or flashback Thursday. Um, I found this picture of me at a riding school. It was the first riding school. I was 11 years old. My mom took me on Saturdays for lessons and that's really where I started riding. But I've been to the hack stable as a kid for my birthday and things like that beforehand. So, you know, we as a family would go to the hack stables for birthday parties or, you know, um, for Saturday rides, and we could ride a horse. So it was and, part of life even before the actual education part of it came into play? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a horse on my first birthday cake. Um, oh. But but we had, but there was this little riding stable, you know, just down, down the road, not far, maybe, you know, less than two miles. And the other one was, probably three miles away and my dad would take us on a Saturday and we'd go and ride. Um, and you know, it's like we we don't have riding schools for kids to go and ride and learn about horses and be involved unless it's like the elite. I mean, unless you've got the gazillions of dollars and can have the horse where you walk in and it's all packed up and you get on and you go, right. you know, where's the average kid gonna go to a riding stable and and be able to be around a horse and and fall in love right um, and, and with like you said the real real quality education because i see riding programs all around the country as far as lesson barns and so many of them really now are focused on on a discipline you know focused on if you're not showing you're not part of their program right that's what i mean it's it's yeah. they're very targeted as opposed to being 
uh, like, like again in Europe, you can go and just you go and have your weekly riding lesson, you know, and so that you go and you get on a horse and you ride for your hour lesson. And that's what I did as a kid is I went for my weekly riding lesson. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so that, so that you bring in people at different, uh, levels, uh, financially and otherwise, you know, time commitment and financial, but you know, like I live in horse country. I live in, uh, Northern Virginia and I don't even know where I could tell somebody to go to just take riding lessons. Wow. It's kind of, wow. Yeah. It's like every, all the stables I know, they're either private stables or high-end barns or you have to have your own horse mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, but for people to go and be able to take riding lessons, I'm really hard-pressed to be able to name one. Um, now, granted, I have to say, it's not like I've been looking for that. I don't have children looking for that. But in Europe, I can, t- I can name several where I've gone to taught, and that's where what they do. What they do. Okay. Wow. Wow. Um, so I just think, you know, like we have been all over the place tonight. <laughs> right. <laughs> we have. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> I did not have coffee either before this. Okay. I promise you, my last cup of coffee was this morning. Uh, I don't drink coffee afternoon. It's a bad idea for me. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's so nice to have the chance to just um, uh, kind of allow the conversation to go wherever and 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 just kind of you know free free form for sure uh, for sure um it's really it's kind of fun because and, and i knew we would have no have shortage of things to talk about so well, no <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're pretty good at that <laughs> yeah we can we can yak for a while but uh, i don't know yeah. how long have we been talking i don't even well know I'm, I'm looking at my watch right now and we've been live oh. for about an hour and 25 minutes so this is okay. uh I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for, for spending the time, investing the time to share with us like this. Um, and I know everybody out there uh, listening is enjoying this as if well. If they're still we there. Keep, <laughs> if they're still there, right? Yeah, we keep getting uh, we keep getting little thumbs and smiley faces and hearts flying past the screen. Oh, oh good. So, I, I'm not uh, getting that. So I'm right, not right. That's, so, uh, and actually, that's, maybe that's, if you don't mind, maybe we'll turn to this a little bit. Um, because there's been a couple questions posted. Do you mind if oh, yeah, I scroll yeah, through a couple for you? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So, uh, let's see one of them on here. Okay. I'm just going to go to the top. Um, so Deb asks a question, um, and I guess we'll try to make these answers short because I think we're going to have a bunch of people chiming in and that's awesome, but I don't want to, I don't want to miss any questions that come in. So we'll try to be kind of short and sweet with our answers. Um, Deb wants to know, what are your thoughts on standard single jointed bits versus linked double jointed? Um, so I, I'm going to guess she's meaning something like a, a normal, like a French uh, link or yeah, something. a yeah. French link versus a single jointed, uh, single jointed bit. So what are your thoughts on that, Deb? Well, that, my thought is the horse gets to choose. Um, so I can give you all the opinions I have on all the different bits that exist and I can tell you all the pros and cons. But in the end, it's that horse is going to tell you what it, it most prefers. Because I've seen some horses where I thought, oh, they'd love a French link. And it was too much movement in their mouth. Yep. And they mm-hmm. wanted actually a straight bar, right? Yep. A mullen mount yep. with no joint at all. Um, and other horses, I'm thinking, oh, this, this bit's going to be great. Spits it out. You know, yep. got to go somewhere else. So, um, but on the, on the other side, just talking about a single jointed bit, what you have to realize is you have a locking side and a non-locking side Mm -hmm. and that you can't avoid because of the design of the joint itself. So you'll, if you take a single jointed snaffle and you twist one side of the bit, you're going to feel it'll travel smoothly on the link and the other side, it'll jam. Yep. And that all it's because of the design. There's no way around it unless you get like a miler with a barrel roll single joint. Mm-hmm. And that's, that, then we've changed completely because it doesn't have that linkage in the middle. Right. And the whole so, function changes at that point. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but if we're just talking a straight single jointed bit, you know, this is something, um, and I saw in that picture that I'm going to put up on Thursday, that throwback picture. My teacher was, his name was Mr. Davies. He was an old Welsh guy. And I didn't realize it until I looked at this picture how many millions of years later. 
you know, all the chin straps everybody puts under the chin. He took a piece of strap like that and he put it over the horse's nose. And what I realized by doing that is he limited how much uh, the kids could pull on the horse's mouth. In other words, oh, yeah. if you took on the snaffle, it would go only it would then start to put nose pressure on the horse instead of jaw pressure. Right. And I thought it was brilliant. Right. Almost like, more like a, uh, what do they call those, combination hackamore kind of ideas. Um, Have you seen those where it's got a bit and a nose piece? Yeah, but this is actually stabilizing the snaffle over the horse's nose. Gotcha. Okay. 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 I'll, 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 hopefully I'll remember to put the picture up tomorrow. But I was like, wow, this is so smart because if I do pull on the snaffle, um, there's going to be some lip pressure but then it's going to have nose pressure and then i'm not going to have jaw pressure and i thought wow that guy was brilliant he yeah, really was very forward um, thinking there know, that's awesome how many millions of years later do you discover you know you didn't even know what he did um, <laughs> right anyway, it's okay. amazing it's amazing awesome yeah. and and um, you know i'll chime in on that as well in that you know it comes down to the experimentation and something i tell riders all the time is when the horse tells us what he likes best who are we to argue you know yeah but, yeah okay. we, we have you know so i have actually a whole um crate of bits and if somebody like wanting to know what bit's going to work on their horse, you pull out the crate and you there just you start go. going through it yep. and, and look in the horse's mouth. I mean, this one horse, when I looked in his mouth, he was curly cueing his tongue. It was amazing. Mm, yep. um, you know, you got to look in there. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So next question, Renee asks the question. She says, I can start my ride with an aligned position, but it's hard to keep once we are in motion. I'm constantly checking and reorganizing during my ride. Is this normal? It can be frustrating. Does it get any better? Um, okay, I have two thoughts on that. One, I just wonder how her saddle's fitting her because if she keeps finding herself out of position, it may be that her tack keeps moving her out. Yeah. And that's just, you know, from from just a question like that, it's, it's without a photograph, it's really hard to say, or without some video, it's really hard to say. But if you're... If you know where you want to be and you keep struggling to be there as soon as you start to move, then there's two thoughts. One, is the saddle, are you trying to ride around your saddle? Is your saddle influencing you so much that you can't? And two, is there, you know, then I start to think about, well, how much pressure is there on the stirrup? Because that can push mm -hmm. us out of the and people don't realize how much pressure they put on the stirrup because our nervous system adapts to that pressure and we can't sense it as pressure. It's normal. So, um, but if she, if, she's, if she knows where she wants to be and she keeps putting herself there and she can't stay there, then we have to say, well, it, it's, what is going on that's causing that to happen? We have to look a little deeper. We have to ask that question. And that's, I think, what her frustration is, that she doesn't know where to look next. Um, that's where, you know, a, a, if she wanted to put up a photograph on my Facebook page, tell her to do that and I can give her a quick Awesome, peek and awesome, great. So yeah. Renee, if you're, if you're still listening, Wendy's invited you to do that with the photo. That'd be fantastic. And I, I hope to catch that if, uh, if you do that, Renee, that'd be great. So awesome. Well, thank you for that, Wendy. That's fantastic. And yep. so that's, um, Let's see. Oh, oh, okay. So Chris has pushed a question in here, um, squeaking it in at the last minute. Should we use Surefoot ourselves to find a new balance? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, in fact, we're, I'm working on a program, uh, Surefoot for People. I have a great guy who's a personal trainer, and he used to ride as a kid, and he does martial arts. I just spent, like, a couple hours with him yesterday, and we want to develop a whole Surefoot for People program. I already have people standing on the pads that absolutely love them. The awesome. medium pad seems to be the one that most people like, although, again, it's, you know, personal preference. Um, and, yeah. It, standing on unstable surfaces is great for us too because it keeps us a, a, a adjusting and adapting and developing all those little postural muscles that we need that are the unsung heroes of good balance. So yes. Fantastic. Great question. 
Fantastic. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, so um, we're going to close off the questions for now. And if more come in, uh, Wendy and I are actually chatting about two more dates of doing these live broadcasts throughout the rest of this year. So if more questions come in, we'll be able to bring those up uh, in the next broadcasts that we do. So uh, let's see, Wendy, I'm just going to fire off a couple questions at you oh, here. Oh, somebody just had a great, by the way, somebody had a great um uh, suggestion that we have a collaborative horse camp together. I'm all which is about a great it. Great idea. Yeah. I am so all am about I. that. That would be fantastic. And that kind of goes in line, I think, a little bit with what you and I were talking about over Jenny's ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I think we did, Jack. <laughs> Jack yeah. Felt bad at it. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, if people are asking. No more Jenny's, you don't live there anymore. <laughs> right, I know, right? I know. I And I haven't missed it until this call. I won't lie. Oh, this call has okay. got me thinking, man, I could really go for some Jenny's ice cream right now. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Oh, goodness. Okay, All right. Well, and, so. and if people want to, I can't seem to post the photo of the highlight bone on your page. I stuck it on my business page and put up a little note. Um, okay. And, and uh, I don't know why, but I'll put up the title of the book that I talked about. Oh, fantastic. Great. And I'll, I'll yeah. find a way to share that also from your page to mine here, um, whether it's in the thread here or whether it's something separate. Uh, so fantastic. Okay. So a couple quick wrap up questions. If there was one, uh, I think I know the answers. Um, if there was one specific thing you could tell every rider to focus on as a primary means of improving their horsemanship, what would that one thing be? Have fun. Have, have fun. fun oh Make it nice fun. <laughs> nice i love it okay if you could ride with anybody past or present who would it be mm. and why oh oh this is like the actor studio past or present oh i'm gonna say arthur Cotton. Nice. um and um but you know if i you, but I'm going to put a caveat on that. If there was one person I would really like to meet, past, well, there's two, past and present. Well, actually, I haven't met one. But jean Fort Payard, I would love it, although I don't speak French, so hopefully his English would be good enough for me to understand. I would love to have met that man. Um, I just His book is the only book I have multiply highlighted with different colors and, and paged, tabbed. And I just, I just so find his book... Like he talks about the term engagement and he goes to the definition of the term. And anytime the hind leg is moving forward underneath the body is engagement. It's a question of whether it's good engagement or poor engagement, but it's the leg moving forward under the body. And all of his stuff in this book is explained in those simple terms. That is what I'm always trying to do is, is simplify it and make it clear and easy to understand. And he does that beautifully in this book. So he would be the guy, if there was somebody that I would really like to meet um, and, and sit down and talk with, it would be him. Fantastic. Very cool. Now, I can't wait to read that book now that you've said that. That's awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Okay. And of course, I have Nuno Oliveira. His, his picture is on my wall. When I sit at my desk, I stare straight ahead at his picture every day. Oh, nice. Nice. So, you know, so there's the other one that I, I would... Um, you know, really have liked to have met. And and Dr. Feldenkrais. Dr. So, Feldenkrais, oh, yeah. yeah. Not a first person, but right. they're, you know, right. brilliant, huge, brilliant Huge man. influence, though, yeah. 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 All right, great. So okay. uh, last wrap-up question with this. How do you define horsemanship? Oh. Um, how do I define it? Um, wow. Uh, that's a, okay, I'm going to have to think about that. Um, but maybe this is the way to answer it. I have not ridden my horse. I have, I'm sorry to say, I have ridden my horse once since last November because my schedule has been crazy and he had two abscesses, one after the other in the spring when I could not, uh, when I had time to ride. And tonight I went to my horse because it was finally not a million degrees and because he's a big bodied horse and he sweats really badly in the heat. And I just can't take an unfit horse and run him around. I think it's unfair to him. So I waited and today was a nice day. 
I took my horse out of the field. I brought him in the barn. I groomed him. I tacked him up. I did no groundwork. I got on. I walked my horse down the road. My horse walked perfectly. And so to me, horsemanship is the, is the ability to educate the horse to understand his self-confidence to be able to do his job efficiently and easily. And it is my job to educate him and to be responsible, and, and that's really key, to be responsible to his needs, that my equipment is working properly, that he is confident and capable, that I can leave that horse for a year and get on. And when I took him down to the arena and I trotted him a couple of steps because he's like really unfit. Um, but I could say, can you give me a hunch then? Can you give me a shoulder? And he's like, yes, here you are. Because he knows his job. He yeah. understands what I'm asking. He knows his job. And, and, and it's like, you know, I mean, literally no warm up, no groundwork. I just get on my horse. <laughs> and it's not like I asked him to do anything terribly advanced. Right? right. But that to me is what I'm, what I'm, when I look at somebody's horses, are they, or, you know, we shouldn't have to do a million things just to ride. We should be able to ride. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. I love it. I love it. That's a great, great definition of horsemanship. Okay. So kind of long, now, but... Wendy, we've done a couple videos together. This is our first audio, but you know how I roll. So, the question of the day. You get to ask for everybody out there the question of the day this evening. That about the question of the day. Uh, can you just get on your horse and ride? There you go. Perfect. I love it. Okay, gang. Can you just get on your horse and ride? So, Wendy, we have made this an hour and 40 minute broadcast. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, and I want to thank everybody out there who's been tuned in listening as well. Don't forget, gang, please, if you have friends that would be interested in hearing this broadcast, please tag them in the comment section below the broadcast or feel free to share this with them. Also, don't forget, you can now find this Talking About Horses audio broadcast on iTunes in the Apple Store or whatever that is, however that works. Um, cool. I'm I'm a smartphone guy, but not an iPhone guy, so I don't I can't even access. It, uh, so. One of these days you'll catch up with that. <laughs> I know I'll get there one of these days. So, <laughs> all right, gang, thank you so much. Our next broadcast actually is going to be tomorrow, doing two nights in a row back to back. Tomorrow, chatting with Craig Johnson on reining horsemanship and the state of the industry. So don't forget oh, tune in tomorrow for that at eight o'clock. Uh, all right. Well, thank you, Wendy. Any closing thoughts? Thanks, Patrick. This has been a blast. Oh, this has been so much fun. Hang on just a bit. I'm going to end the broadcast here, and then we'll chat for a couple minutes after. Thanks, gang. Okay. Tune in next time.